Hey, this is The Game, Triple H. You're watching Loudwire. Hey everyone, Graham from Loudwire here, and it's Wikipedia Fact or Fiction time with the founder of NXT and Loudwire's Metal Ambassador of the Decade, Paul Triple H Levesque. Thank you so much, Thank man. You, man. Thank so, you. So, so appreciate This ought to be it. interesting. Wikipedia about me should have lots of fun facts in Okay, there. it always is interesting. So, let's I'm start. I'm just saying fact or fiction, right? That's it. Fact or fiction, right. you can tell us the story, okay, elaborate right. if you want. <laughs> Uh, first, because we check with everyone, uh, Paul Michael Levesque, yes, yes. born in Nashua, New Hampshire. Yeah. That is true. Okay, they do get that wrong sometimes. Uh, it says on Wikipedia that w you watched your first wrestling match uh, at five years old, and it was uh, a Chief J Strongbow match. Actually, that is accurate. That's accurate. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I was five, I, uh, but I was very young, and, and the, the facts of what I remember is uh, I, I had on a plastic little football helmet and I had okay. a little plastic football and I remember this is how long ago it was we had a big console TV my dad went up and was changing the channel on mm -hmm. the TV and I was running around doing the football thing and uh, he stopped on wrestling mm -hmm. and went and sat down grew up in New England so it was WWF um, he sat down and I remember looking at it and I know it was chief just because I remember seeing the guy with a big feathered headdress and I stopped and they started to wrestle and I took the helmet off, I put the football in the helmet, I put it down and I went and climbed up my dad's lap and sat down and was mesmerized. And then, you know, I remember him telling me what it was and then that's, man, that's all I wanted to watch. And then from there on out, that's what I did. We would go to shows, my grandfather, my, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of, that was my, my thing growing up for sure. But it awesome. started young. All right, so that's true. Uh, it said that while you were working at a man as a manager at Gold's Gym in Nashua, you were introduced to world champion powerlifter Ted Archidi, mm -hmm. uh, who was employed by WWE <laughs> at the time. Uh, eventually, after numerous attempts, you finally persuaded him to introduce you to Killer Kowalski, who trained you. Mildly true. M okay. So what <laughs> so, happened? Uh, I wasn't at Gold's, but it was a, I was running a gym. A gym. Um, okay. He came in. We became friends. He was no longer wrestling. He was doing it on occasion. Gotcha. Um, Ted was uh, the first um, first man in uh, history to bench press over 700 pounds. Wow. He was. Uh, he then parlayed that. He was smart. He then parlayed that into a, a quick wrestling career. He would always try to dissuade me from it, and um, I was constantly on him. And then he gave me two phone numbers. Finally. Okay. One was for Ken Passarello in in Orange. Connecticut for mm -hmm. a, a, a gym called Passarello's Quest, which was uh, training people uh, with Tony Altimore. And then okay. uh, a, a number that he didn't know Kowalski at all. He had just gotten a number from somebody. Um, and he said, look, here's two numbers. Do what you want with them, you know. Okay. And uh, I called both. And Kowalski was actually his home phone number. And then <laughs> that's how I got started in the business. I, I just really wanted to get in and, you know, uh, the rest of it is history, but so uh, mostly true. Mildly true, yeah. yes. Uh, it says on Wikipedia that you began training in 1992, but you didn't start using the pedigree until you were performing for WCW in 94. The first time I did the pedigree was actually at Kowalski's. Okay, gotcha. And it's funny because I've actually now seen, which was only in the last year or two, I've seen a clip of Andre the Giant doing a very similar move. Really? Where he, uh, you know, the guys in the old days used to do the move where they put the guy's head between their knees and jump up and like, oh sure, j sure. jar their neck, right? Yeah. But Andre uh, did it in Japan with Anoki where he held his arms and dropped to his knees and like, Anoki took like a pile driver. Okay. But I had never seen that. It was only up until a couple of years ago um, when I saw that for the first time and like, wow, that's really cool. How I just came to it was that exact thing. Kowalski used to do the thing where you put the guy's head there and jump and the guy would take a bump out of right. it. And um, he was doing, he was showing it to somebody one day and I, I hated that move oh. just because I thought it looked hokey. And, uh, but he was showing it to somebody at the camp and I was like, hey, you know, man, if you went down with that, like it's like a face first kind of pile driver thing, that would actually be kind of cool. And then I started thinking about it. I was like, you kind of have to hook a guy's arms or something, right? So yeah. I just started messing around with it there. And, uh, but it's one of those things like when you're trying to figure it out and nobody could figure out how to do it 
like as I was trying to figure it out, guys would always complain like, dude, I just smashed my entire face, you know. Um, so trying to figure it out. I started using it a little in WCW because I felt like it was different and no one had ever seen it. Sure. And the first couple of times that I did it, when I would come back, people were like, what's that one thing you did that was really cool? Um, when I came up to, to WWE at the time, they changed my character to the stuff. Originally, they wanted me to use uh, the RKO, like a version of... Oh, a cutter, yeah. 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 Um, and it was what they, they, they were just like, hey, how about this as a finish? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, okay, you know, and uh, Dallas Page called me very upset. Really? Yeah, and I was like, Dallas. <laughs> oh, no. I, I, he knows I, he didn't invent the cutter, right? He, no, he does, but he, <laughs> okay. you know, it's Dallas, and, and uh, Johnny gave it to him. Okay. So, um, but there was a couple of matches that I did with, like, enhancement guys where it didn't look good. And I came back and was like, man, that thing just sometimes it's hit or miss. And they were like, yeah, you're right. Is there anything else you can do? So uh, that next day when we were at TV, I went to the ring in the afternoon where just grabbed a guy and, and showed him the pedigree. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, that's so much better. Let's do that. So then that became the thing. And I would just work with guys in the afternoon on making sure they could take it right. Um, and then Michael Hayes is the one that named it because my character was a blue blood. Sure. Michael Hayes was in the company and Michael Hayes was like, hey man, what if you called that the pedigree? You know what I mean? Like you're giving some guys pedigree. You know? It worked for me. It said that you left for WWE in January 1995 after WCW turned down your request to be promoted as a singles competitor. No, that's false. That's false, okay. So um, I when I went to WCW, they, wanted to talk, they offered me a, a multi-year deal. I, I, this is one of those things where like you look back now and go like, I can't believe I had the balls to do that. <laughs> um, it was for very little money, which mm. won't sound like it was very little money now, but it was like for 50 grand. But at that time you paid all your own expenses and I was on the road a lot. Gotcha. So I was, I was, I was losing a lot of money wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, so by the time I got to the end and I was broke, but when they first offered me the contract, I was like, man, it's, you know, it's not a lot of money. And Bischoff was like, well, I'm not paying you more money. And I was like, all right, well, it's a multi-year deal. What if I just did one year? And he was like, so I'm offering you multi-years, you just want to sign one? Like, it's kind of a dumb decision. I said, look, here's how I look at it. Let me wrestle for you for a year. At the end of the year, I'm either going to be like, you're either going to know I'm worth a lot more than 52 grand, or I ain't worth keeping. Things were such a mess there. Sure. And even Nitro hadn't started yet, but you could see the mess coming. And uh, everybody that was had come there or gone to WCW from New York, WWE, was like if I was asking anybody, my contract's coming up, anybody that had been up here was like, dude, get out of here. Mm. Go up there, Vince will make you a star. I came up and met with Vince. First meeting with him, I don't think he knew who I was. I think somebody had just asked him to take the meeting and he wasn't, like I left thinking like, well, I guess they weren't that interested in me. I wrestled Starcade, it was my first pay-per-view ever. Mm -hmm. I wrestled Alex Wright at Starcade. Okay. They got Vince on the phone and then Vince said, uh, hey, I saw you at uh, Starcade yesterday, I want you to come here. And now he was what I wanted him to be. He was like, I want Gosh, you to come yeah. here. I think you're a talented kid. I'm not offering you any spot. I'm offering you a spot. I don't guarantee money, but I, you know, I had told him when I came in, I'm not interested. It's not about the money for me. I want to work every day. I want to work the best. I want to be the best. Yeah. Uh, and he said, uh, I promise you this, you'll work here every single day. You'll work with the best guys in the business. And if you want to get great, this is where to do it. That was all I needed to hear. I said, no. Uh, there you go. Tell me when I start. <laughs> all right. History. Uh, there's a contradiction on Wikipedia on to who uh, created the D-Generation X name. Uh, one page says it was Vince Russo, and another page says that it was New York Post columnist uh, Phil Mushnick. Mushnick would have nothing to do with it. I believe the name came from Shane. Shane. The first time I ever heard it was from Shane. Really? Um, hmm. Brett had said we were nothing but a bunch of degenerates, right? Like, they're just losers, a bunch of degenerates. And, but he had said the flick backstage. And, uh, but Shane had, was saying uh, to somebody, and I believe the first time I ever heard it was he was saying to somebody, yeah, but they, these guys represent, like, they're young, and this is kids today. They're like Generation X, man. They are that thing. Yeah. And, you know, it, he combined the two, and he's like, it's like degenerates, but they're Generation X, like D-Generation X. And that's, th that was the first time I ever heard it. And then we flipped it into a promo. That's when we said it live was, Brett said it in a promo, you're nothing but a bunch of loser degenerates. 
and then Sean said, no, no, we're, we're, we're degenerates, we're Generation X, we're, we are D-Generation X, and that was the first time we said it. So I don't believe that's actually a Vince Russo or a Mushnick thing. I believe both of those are wrong. Okay, well, good to clear that up. All right, uh, it says that uh, Vince was hesitant to let the DX members perform the crotch chop at first, but was later talked into it. Vince was hesitant about almost everything we were doing at first. Um, there's a period of time in the very beginning of this where every week when we would come back, he would ream us. And like, you guys are going to get us thrown off the air. I mean, and Sean was, Sean was the guy that, it, because Sean was so talented, he could get away with things that to this day I still can't believe that he would do with Vince, but Vince... It's almost like a, a Vince saw himself as a dad to Sean and thought, like, I can't throw this kid out because he'll self-destruct, so I have to keep him with me to teach him how to be something more. So he would put up with these things to try to mold him into being something better. Okay. I was the guy that was just next to him going, geez, I hope we don't get fired, mm -hmm. right? When Vince is mad, it, it, his eyes change. And I can remember being in the ring and him, this is when we were unscripted, very unscripted. Mm -hmm. And I remember them saying, and then, uh, you know, Sean will cut a promo, you're gonna cut a promo, you can do it directly to Vince and the whole thing. And I'm like, how far can I go? And he was like, go where you think you can. That's what he told me backstage. Wow. And I remember cutting the promo and being in his face. And when wow. we walked backstage, he was pissed. <laughs> but I, when I went to him and I said, was that okay? And he was like, yeah, that was fine. And walked away from me and I was like, Jeez. right. Oof. <laughs> But every week we were getting it. There's a flip point on that, and it's kind of a cool story, where USA was now starting to send letters that we were going to get thrown off the air. Sure. USA then sent a letter to us that said, here is a very distinct, from eight or, or whatever the hours we were on the air, from eight to nine or whatever it was, D-Generation X, they, they, th this group, they can't say these words. They can't do this. They can't do that. From nine to 10, we're okay with them doing this, but they still can't say that and do this. Mm -hmm. And when we got to TV that day, Vince was like, you guys happy? Well, look at that. You know, get it taken off the air and the whole thing. But things were starting to click. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had both noticed that Vince was starting to get less vocal about screaming at us when we came back. Right? Okay. It was, it was rather than a 10 minute promo, it was a five minute promo. And, and so he was like, what do you guys want to do about this? Right? We got, we got to straighten this stuff out, guys. And we were like, let's use it. And that's when we did the, it's the Bill Clinton promo yep. in front of the podium where we say every horrible thing. I mean, we basically verbatim, some of it read off the sheet of paper that they had sent us and beeped it out and did this whole big thing and it started the show. Like Vince thought it was funny and uh, was like, yeah, we'll see what happens. Where, where's it, <laughs> where's it can happen? They don't, they hate it and they, you know, we're headed down that road anyways. And um, we did it. And, Shortly thereafter, we got a letter that said bravo on using the, the letter uh, for something entertaining, and the numbers are going up. Yeah. Congrats. And that was like the somebody came and unclicked the handcuffs on wow. us, and DX was free to go do what we were doing. And then it started to become encouraged. Um, and then they wanted to try to script us. And uh, I remember Sean crumpling up a piece of paper throwing it and bouncing it off Vince's forehead and saying, you didn't write it before, you ain't writing it now, and walking out of the room, and I was like, so, <laughs> I'm just oh gonna boy. go with him. Uh, but that's, it was, uh, it was tense, but it was good. Wow, and last one for you today. It says that the game nickname was originally intended for Owen Hart. Hmm. That's not I, true. It's a funny thing, I have no idea where that rumor came from. Hmm. Okay. The game was never a nickname that was intended for anybody. I legitimately said it in a promo, right. off the cuff, an unscripted promo with Jim Ross. Gotcha. We were backstage, it was an unscripted promo. Jim, I mean, literally came in and said, I'm gonna ask you these questions, answer how you want. Mm -hmm. It was right when I was turning, I, I was really becoming the hard-edged heel. And, um, the, a big term then was student, being a student of the game. Yeah. Like if you really want to be good at this business, you got to be a student of the game. Just like anything else, you want to you want to be a, a great NBA player. You got to be a student of the game. You got to watch the people that came before you. You got to study everything. All of that. It was said a lot in our business. Sure. And in that promo, I and it like legitimately use the F word, 
and they had to beep it out. They, the promo was so good that they were like, we're going to keep it. We're just going to beep out the, the F word. But it, I didn't think anything more about it than that. And then following week on TV, when I came out, there were signs that just said Triple H, the F and game or Triple H is a game, whatever it was. The game thing stuck. I remember distinctly walking out on stage and seeing like six or seven signs and thinking like, like it took me a second to go like, oh, that's right. I said that last week in that promo. <laughs> like, but that stuck. Mm. That's it. Yeah. And I and and then that became the thing. And I went backstage after and was like, hey, the game is is it now. Like it's everywhere out there. And I buzzed Jr. Jr. started saying it on commentary. You know, a lot of that stuff then was organic. Mm. Uh, to, you know, uh, cerebral assassin just came from Jr. Yeah. King of Kings. Just I just said it in promo. A lot of lot of champions. A lot of icons. A lot of people claim they're the king. There's only one King of Kings. There's only one champion of champions. There's only one. And that stuck. Like, just certain things that you say that organically resonate. The game was just that. So I, I don't. I have no idea where the Owen thing came from. Yeah, I don't know. But I had never heard it until like a couple of years ago, and then I, you know, heard that go around. So but that's Wikipedia for you. Yeah. And, and then the the game becomes a Motorhead song. So yeah, and classic. you know the, the the Motorhead connection for me was when they were trying to create a new theme song for me, and I wanted a certain vibe. They weren't getting it right, and there was a certain point in time where I was talking to Kevin Dunn, our executive producer, and uh, he was like, man, I'm, I'm frustrated. We can't get this right for you. And I kept telling him this guttural, you know, raw uh, sound, and he was like, can, can, give me an example. And I said, motorhead, like motorhead, like that just, just in your face, raw guttural sound. And he was like, well, maybe we just see if they can do it. And I was like, well, I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> yeah. If that's an option, absolutely. And... Uh, he called me back a couple of days later and said, they're going to do it. And I, I had no, I didn't know them. I didn't, it wasn't for a couple of years before I would really get to know Lem. Um, and then, you know, meet him a few times. And then when we really became close was, uh, I did a track for them on an album called Hammered. Mm, uh, yeah, called yeah. Serial Killer, where they, they called and they synced our voices together on this yeah. thing. But I, I spent a little bit of time with them in the studio during that. And... Um, he had already done all his stuff, so it was just kind of he and I sitting around, and that's where we really kind of bonded and connected and then formed this really cool friendship that lasted until right around when he died. You know? Yeah, it's absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you so much for giving me your time today. Thank you, man. I so appreciate it, and thank you so much for giving Metal uh, such a great platform. Uh, it's my honor, man. Thank you guys for, for, you know, I'm, I'm the kid that was at the the uh, at rocket records in <laughs> nashua new hampshire yeah buying the the vinyls and the cassettes and trying to find the new bands that were up and coming so for me um j just this whole being kept alive all these years and now seeing a resurgence of it is awesome man i'm a, i'm i'm a fan of of all of it so i just want to keep seeing it keep going absolutely thank you so much thank you. you're an absolute legend uh, triple h everyone